Hi, right, welcome everyone to this talk on AI Model Efficiency Toolkit. Uh, my name is Avi Kobre. I work for Qualcomm AI Research. Um, and, you know, I focus on uh, this field called model efficiency. And I want to motivate to you why, uh, why is model efficiency important in this talk. And I also want to introduce this, this toolkit to you. Um, so uh, while I focus on this model efficiency uh, space, you know, I and my team also work on building uh, these tools uh, that help, you know, engineers uh, within Qualcomm, but like we want to actually uh, impact the wider community. So um, as we all know, you know, deep learning and deep neural networks are all the rage currently. Um, if you look over time, uh, the the networks have grown uh, more and more complex, um, and you know they they have grown in size, uh, both in like space, but they have also grown in complexity. And if you if you take all of this together, and if you see on like the y-axis, the 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 networks, you know, the energy consumption of the networks keeps growing up, you know, uh, expo exponentially, if you may. Um, and there is, you know, there's no uh, current limit in sight on when this is going to end. So, um, yeah, we, while this is all good for us, but I think, you know, it, it's, uh, we need to solve this in some better fashion uh, because clearly we can't let the energy uh, consumption of these uh, deep neural network solutions keep growing at the current pace. So how do we go about this, right? So um, a lot, traditionally, a lot of the um, neural networks, they run on the cloud. And that will continue to be the case. I think, you know, a lot of uh, applications have been enabled by the cloud and that's not going away. However, um, if you look at the devices around you, right? If you look at just what you have at the moment, uh, you have cell phones, you have tablets, computers, you have smart watches, you have your cars, you have your TVs, your refrigerators, air VR headsets. There's a whole bunch of devices around us. Each of these devices is a, a AI device, if you may, right? So they are, even today, they are probably running uh, some machine learning, some deep neural networks, uh, but definitely in the future, this is just going to keep growing. Uh, and this is actually a good thing. So this, uh, the having the on-device AI will complement uh, AI running on the cloud. Not, you know, no one is the winner. They they just complement each other. And so this is the on-device AI has you know certain characteristics that are actually uh, make it uh, much more uh, appealing. And one of the characteristics is privacy. A uh, lot of times, like, you know, let's say we are uh, doing, uh, you know, something running on the phone uh, and trying to do some, uh, trying to listen to your voice and give you some, you know, uh, uh, do something for you, write an email, type something up. Uh, any, any of these uh, interactions that we have with the devices that we touch, uh, generally are private and so privacy is a big concern and you know having keeping that uh, communication local is is appealing uh, to users um, similarly if you look at like things like automotive uh, you you require a lot of reliability you don't want just because your network connection has gone down you don't want your car to go crash somewhere so you want um, your device to keep uh, operating irrespective of you know what kind of network connection you have so you need reliability um, also low latency which you know may be impacted by going going to the cloud and back and also if you see these devices keep you know producing uh, ever growing gazillion uh, amount of information and even with like these uh, 5g networks coming up and we are going to see like a humongous growth and uh, capability of the networks but nevertheless uh, by keeping some you know not needed information of the network is is good because you can 
uh, reduce your network bandwidth, save energy, help the planet. So um, all this is good. Uh, so what's the problem? And the problem is, if you look at the uh, deep learning networks or machine learning uh, workloads today, you see that they are very uh, compute intensive. Um, and you they have these, you know, while they're compute intensive, they also, you know, depending on the application, you may have uh, real time constraints. You may want to like look at a video stream and, you know, do some, uh, segmentation on the fly or you know change uh, as you're looking at yourselves in the phone uh, you may want to like change lighting conditions and so on so so there's a real-time aspect to it um, some applications are always on like when we are for example trying to tell our watch to you know hello google or wake up right so those are always on applications so there are all these there are these challenging ai workloads but on the on the right hand side you have these mobile, these uh, edge devices have a very constrained environment. Right? They want, depending on uh, if they are battery powered or even if they're not battery powered, you do you want them to be very efficient? Um, you, you know, they are generally sleek and lightweight designs. Uh, if they're battery powered, they require long battery, battery life, you know, all day usage, those kind of things. And they also have limited storage memory um, constraints, maybe limited bandwidth, maybe limited co compute as well. But all of these limitations, you know, as, uh, you know, Moore's law keeps evolving, I think uh, the devices become more and more powerful, but there is, uh, they are constrained compared to the cloud, right? That will, I think, always remain the case. So we need we can't just you know potentially just uh, do what we do on the cloud on the device i think that that is not going to scale so what do we do so you know we at qualcomm believe that we can we have to tackle this in multiple ways um so we you see in the in the middle bar over there uh the, some of the ways in which we want to make uh, these models efficient our uh, model quantization in the middle will will look a little bit of at that what that means um, but at a high level what that does is instead of running at high precision let's say you're doing uh, 32 bit floating point precision models uh, while training or even you know inferences on the cloud on the on the edge devices you could scale it down and use lower precision math and we'll, we'll look at you know, why that is useful. There is model compression that you see on the left, which is, um, you know, can we take these models that we have, uh, you know, developed after a lot of uh, sweat and tears, uh, but given a particular use case, right? It may be a model may be designed for something, but then you want to detect faces out of it. It could detect a whole lot of things, but you, you specifically want to detect faces out of it. Can we make that model, can we compress it down for the particular use case such that it is a smaller model, a more compute, less compute intensive model? So that's called uh, model compression. We'll look at, a, look at that a little bit. Uh, and that there are other techniques like, you know, compilation, can we use a machine learning compiler to you know, optimize this up. Just like we write code and a compiler, you know, makes, uh, you know, looks looks at our code and uh, try, tries to take away the redundancies and makes it more efficient uh, at runtime. Can we do the same thing with machine learning models? So we are, we are you know, exploring all these angles. Um, and also, of course, at the bottom is, you know, different hardware architectures, different hardware accelerators, uh, those are being researched, uh, including you know stuff like you know can we uh, just do compute in memory? Can do we do we need a specific compute? Can some other compute be just done in memory? So there are all these exciting uh, different uh, areas of making models efficient. Uh, for this particular talk, we are going to focus on that on the one in the middle, quanti model quantization and model compression. And these are the techniques that are built into this AI model efficiency toolkit. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Okay, so what is a network quantization? And I uh, told you in a very, at a very high level, um, it, it basically involves, like if you see the picture on the right, it's trying to motivate through completely unrelated example. It's saying like, if you had 
a, a higher bit width image and if you you know reduce the you know pixel bit width of the image uh, you can see artifacts you know going from 24 to 8 bits and then if you go down to one bit um, you would like basically lose the color and so on and so forth so um, in a very similar fashion you can apply uh, analog that similar analogy to a um, uh, neural network model and so what happens is uh, you can, you know, you when we train the models, you would have, you know, floating point, 32 bit uh, floating point numbers for the model parameters. Uh, and then each layer, like if you're doing a convolutional layer, you're convolving using uh, floating point, 32 bit, you know, multiply and accumulates. Can we change that into integer? So going from floating point uh, compute to integer compute is itself a big leap. Uh, but then, you know, do we need 32 bits? Can we scale it down to 16 bits? Can we even scale it down to 8 bits? Maybe, you know, beyond that. So uh, these are the things, uh, you know, scaling down from floating point to integer and then scaling down the bit width from 32 to, let's say, 8 is generally what is called network quantization. And so the way this works is uh, not only do the, the parameters get quantized, but the compute gets quantized as well. So you're doing like in this particular picture, I don't have a pointer to point, but look at the first blue layer, that's a convolutional uh, layer. And then you have a second layer in uh, this yellow color, and that's also a convolutional layer. So the, let's say the input comes in at eight bit integers and you have eight bit parameters feeding into that convolutional layer, the blue one. Uh, so the output of that layer would be like uh, at an accumulator bit width, like you'll do multiply and adds and, you know, soon you will grow from your 8-bit to, let's say, back to 32 bits, because in, depending on how much you're convolving, you need to accumulate uh, a lot of values. And so what would happen is you would like convert those 32-bit integers back into 8-bit. And the way you do that is, um, you know, finding a scale, a scale factor for every, every layer. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, but before we get there, so what's, why, why do all this? What, what do we gain out of this, right? So, um, of course we know, uh, you know, we can do the math and we say, okay, 32 bits to eight bits, that's uh, reduction in memory usage, right? So we, that's a, a 4X reduction right there, as you can see. Uh, in the left picture, but that's not the whole story, right? Uh, if you look at the latency, it's not only that we have reduced the memory, but we have actually reduced the compute needed uh, from uh, floating point of math to integer math. And so that has a, uh, you know, as a speed up, if you may, in, in how many inferences per second you can do. But now start looking at other things where you can see more dramatic gains. Like if you look at the power consumption numbers, uh, if you look at add and multiply, uh, those are the tables on the left, you would see like dramatic gains, right? Uh, I mean, we are talking here on a factor of 30, factor of 20 kind of gains uh, compared to floating point, uh, 32 bit versus integer eight bit. Um, and you know, a lot of it uh, don't take you know these exact numbers to heart. I think it all depends on you know how your hardware is designed and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think the the takeaway point here is that you get dramatic gains. Uh, same way, you know, not only having less memory usage is good to you know have require less memory, but it also has a benefit of reducing your memory access because a lot of times when when you're running uh, machine or AI workloads, what you're doing is you're like taking, you know, let's say the model parameters or even the activations from a layer, saving it to memory, reading it back from memory. And so you're going back and forth with memory a lot. So if you have less things to you know, go fetch from memory, better for you, less power consumption, faster, so on and so forth. And on the right, you would see that uh, just because doing integer mathematics is uh, much simpler than doing floating point mathematics. You have a dramatic, you know, uh, reduction in silicon area as well. Uh, so the way you look at this is, you know, um, silicon area uh, can, you know, translate to cost, uh, can also translate to more uh, capability. Like if you 
you know something requires less you could do more of it right so all of these are like trade-offs that we can play against but across the board you see like uh, there is there are significant benefits of you know doing things in 8-bit integers okay so all that is good so let's do it uh, of course every, no, no free lunch so everything comes at a cost and so the way um, you generally do there are lots of ways in which you can do these uh, kind of uh, eight bit integer computations let's say uh, but generally what what gets done is at a at a layer uh, basis so let's say if you're doing a convolutional layer what you would do is you would find a scale factor for that layer right so you would say um, the table on the left it's a little too dense uh, here but uh, bear with me so if you look at that a transpose kind of matrix on the left pretend that that's a weight matrix and it has some floating point numbers as you can see uh, only down to two uh, bits of precision but like think of those as floating point numbers now the way you convert them into integer numbers is you could say hey how about i find a scale factor right so if i find a scale factor and in this case that scale factor is let's say 1 over 255 so i keep that scale factor for and remember that for this layer and now if i apply that scale factor to these floating point numbers i get some integer numbers and they happen to be nicely from you know 0 to 255 okay so now i have like 0 to 255 is 2 raised to 8 so we can represent the, these numbers in 8 bits um so that, that's how things are done but however uh, what would happen is you know what what's the meaning of these numbers right so if you take these numbers and start multiplying them and adding them and so on and so forth you get some other numbers but eventually you want you have to convert it back into this um you know something that you can understand into this float domain if you may and so when you do if you if you do, if you apply a scale and then you sort of uh, remove the scale and you look at the output um you will see that there is an error right there is an error because in in case of a 32 bit floating point number you have a lot of precision and um, with uh, 8 bit integers you have 255 values right so clearly you can specify a lot more values with floating point numbers as opposed to the 8 bit numbers and so what would happen is what we are doing is we are mapping you know some buckets of floating point numbers to one uh, number represented by an integer, right? So there is a rounding error, if you may. And all of this uh, translates into errors at the end of the model, right? So we want to reduce this. We want to get, we want to uh, 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 have our cake and eat it too. So we want to uh, use all of those benefits we saw earlier with integers, but you know, not lose any accuracy. And that's that's the whole trick over here. So we at uh, Qualcomm AI Research have been like doing a whole bunch of you know research on uh, quantization techniques, and you'll see uh, some papers there on, on the top, uh, including papers on uh, these very novel techniques called add around and Bayesian bits that are coming up uh, in ICML. Um, so we do we have been doing this research and publishing our you know what we uh, see, uh, not not just to help us but to help everybody, the whole industry. Uh, but now what we are also trying to do is, um, you know, can we uh, take these techniques and make them av available through tools? And so it's uh, easier for somebody, uh, for a user to, you know, instead of reading a paper and trying to do that math themselves, they just use a tool, right? So that th there are two-pronged strategy to so, you know, try to uh, help. Okay, so uh, having said that, um, we created this toolkit called AI Model Efficiency Toolkit, AMET for uh, short. Um, and so what this toolkit does is has these model quantization and model compression techniques. Um, and the way uh, we have uh, designed AMET is it takes in um, a trained model. Uh, so you, uh, you know, this could be a model uh, like by torch or tensorflow models and it you inject that model into this tool and out comes a more optimized model so uh, the toolkit itself is not uh, meant to 
you know, create a quantized model, for example. It's me, it's an efficiency toolkit. So it's, it, it optimizes. So it makes the model better for something. So it makes the model better for running on quantized hardware or makes the model uh, smaller by compressing it. Um, and we can apply both of them together. Right. And the way uh, it has been designed is uh, we will see like for some of the techniques, uh, both from quantization and compression, you may want to train the model a little bit further. Uh, and this has uh, dramatic uh, improvements in accuracy. And so this has been uh, designed such that, you know, the model, the optimized model that you gain, get back, you can train with it a little bit. And so it's, it's still at training time. It, it's not a model that is just, you know, hey, you run on target. Uh, so you can train it a little bit, improve accuracy, and then you uh, basically take it to target. So if you, you know, the one in the middle is how you take your model, you know, uh, how you inject uh, AMET into your workflow. It's a, it's designed to be like a plugin to your existing workflow. And uh, just in May, we uh, made this an open source project. So we are you know very very happy uh, that this is available as an open source project. You can access it on GitHub.com slash quick slash AMET. Quick or QUIC stands for uh, Qualcomm Innovation Center. So this uh, that's the entity uh, that makes AMET available. Um, and one of the things, you know, I think there's a, a lot of uh, other open source projects uh, with uh, respect to uh, even in the model efficiency field, but definitely in the machine learning field. Uh, so what we have tried to do with this project is in addition to just making you know source available, we've tried to make it user friendly. So uh, it includes documentation, includes code examples, uh, API documentations. It has uh, documentation on the techniques. We also created a, a video tutorials that we have you know, uploaded to YouTube. Uh, we'll have a link on that later on. And uh, so yeah, we have, we have tried to make this you know not only uh, something that people can contribute to and like look at the source, see what we have done, but also it is uh, something that can be easily used by somebody. So, you know, why why did we uh, make it open source? So, what what are our goals? Um, so, you know, as we saw, I think the overall goal is to enable uh, you know uh, the whole ecosystem, the whole. Uh, academia industry to uh, leverage these low power edge devices and, and push more and more uh, AI workloads to these edge devices. So that's our uh, overall you know, goal. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, in this, one of the ways to uh, uh, impact the ecosystem is through releasing open source tools, because that's the way um, there's a much better way of collaborating with others because there are a whole bunch of other tools being developed as well um, in this space. And you know, we we don't want to uh, to the second point. We don't want to like uh, necessarily do uh, just repeat what others are doing. We want to do something that is an add-on. And so we have designed these tools to plug in. Uh, let's say with PyTorch or TensorFlow, we we build on top of other. Uh, tools and uh, there may be other tools that users are using and I think this is designed to such that you can layer this up you it's not uh, meant to replace anything it's meant to be added on uh, and overall like if at the end of this we can you know drive the community towards you know low precision inference I think that's that's the main main goal so I think if you look at uh, generally people uh, there's a belief that you know hey models run, good with 32-bit floats, maybe 16-bit floats is, is good enough. But if you go down to 16-bit integers, oh, wow, this is going to be a problem. 8-bit integers, no, that's not going to work. So I think that there is uh, this, uh, uh, you know, some folks have this uh, perception, and we want to uh, remove that perception and, you know, make it uh, easily possible for users to move towards integer inference. So here's a very... Uh, thousand foot or even higher foot view of the architecture. Uh, so I think what I want you to take away from this is uh, there are a bunch of techniques built into these uh, into this toolkit and 
while I may not go into detail on any one of those techniques here, uh, but you know the documentation is there, the videos are there, so you could you know, uh, browse those at your uh, leisure. Uh, I, I will motivate a few of those techniques a little bit. Um, so there are a bunch of techniques built in, and the way we have designed this toolkit is we have have the model optimization part of uh, uh, the code is separate from the extensions for TensorFlow and PyTorch. So we want to make it easy for people. I think PyTorch and TensorFlow are more common um, training frameworks. So we wanted to make them easy for people to plug in their uh, models into AMET. Um, and so we have these extensions built in, but we didn't want the optimizations to be tied to the extensions, right? So tomorrow, if, you know, some collaborator wants to come in and use it with other uh, frameworks, or they may have their uh, homegrown framework and uh, they just want to use the optimizations. I think that is possible for them to do. Of course, if you use it with the these ex uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch extensions, you get higher level APIs, you use the model opt optimization library, you have somewhat lower level APIs, uh, but it's possible. So um, here's a one slide introduction to a, a couple of features on the quantization side. And like I said, I think there are actually a bunch of features that are already in, and we are continuing to add more features. Like we, we saw the add around feature coming in, um, uh, paper coming out in ICML uh, next month. Uh, and so we are going to uh, basically you know, uh, tr try to bring that into AMET as well. But if you, uh, here's two fe features. The one on the left is called uh, data-free quantization. So this was a, a paper we released last year. And this technique, it's actually very, very, uh, very uh, applies very well to these traditionally harder to quantize models uh, in the MobileNet family from uh, Google. Uh, so the MobileNet architecture is uh, designed with these depth-wise convolutional layers or depth-wise separable layers. Um, and they are very efficient at doing, you know, um, machine learning, like vision kind of use cases. Um, but when we take these models, uh, like for example, the MobileNet V2 model, the version two model, take it to a quantized target, you see a sharp drop in accuracy. And depending on how the model is trained, you will get, you know, uh, less sharp and uh, uh, more sharp, uh, but nevertheless, it's a sharp drop in accuracy. Uh, to the extent that it's not usable. So these techniques are, we call them the one on the left, the data-free quantization is a post-training technique, meaning we don't actually require the users to uh, do any further training. Uh, so you simply apply this technique and you get back uh, a better model for quantization. So somewhat in you know, a magical fashion. Uh, and the, there are a bunch of you know different parts to this. So the first part, cross-layer equalization and bias absorption. Basically, what they are doing is you're looking at these layers in the model and you're equalizing the weights of adjacent layers um, so that across the channels in those layers, you have more uh, uniformity uh, and which helps with quantization because when we are trying to find that scale factor across the channels, uh, if you had disparate like ranges in the channels, you would uh, find um, non-optimal scale factors. Uh, on the other hand, if you they were channels were more or less homogeneous, then it's easy to find uh, better scale factors. So that's what those are doing. The last technique, bias correction, is also an interesting uh, artifact. So with these depth-wise separable layers, you have less number of parameters, and so I think there's more of a chance that just by rounding to the nearest, you may you may have a shift in the output of layers and it's just like shift uh, like a shift so we can observe that shift through passing some data and then we can correct that shift and so that's that's what those techniques are so the one on the left data free quantization is a post training technique one on the right is quantization aware training um, and basically this is a technique you will find in other tools as well uh, but we have added a, a few tweaks to it uh, so Overall, what happens here is uh, you have a model, like here you see a snippet of the model, like a convolutional layer followed by a bias hat followed by a ReLU. 
Um, so we add those green bubbles in here, and these are called quantization simulation nodes into this model. Uh, and what they would do is they would try to simulate uh, the, the quantization noise. So specifically, we saw a few slides back that you have the scale factor that you apply, right? And you, you can apply the scale factor and, you know, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, divide by scale and now multiply by scale. So you, uh, these, you get that noise due to the fact of getting rounded to the nearest integer, right? So those green nodes are going to simulate that noise. And so when you simulate that noise, what happens is now you're in your forward pass. If you do an inference on the model using these simulation nodes in built in, uh, you will see that the accuracy now starts uh, mimicking the accuracy you will see on a quantized target. So that's that's good in itself. Like off target, you get a sort of, you know, how much am I going to get on target? You get like a simulated score. But now you can train with this. And so what happens in this training is, uh, interestingly, like the model knows that there is this noise in the forward pass, and it will learn to counteract that noise. So the couple of tweaks we have added with those green ops is we have a way of like inserting those nodes in the right place. So I think it, it turns out that we know we need to insert them in, in the places that uh, how uh, things would run on target, uh, inserting it all over the place or a bit like, let's say, between the convolution and the bias ad or uh, between the bias ad and the railway is not, is not the right thing to do. And so we have uh, a way of like inserting in the right place and we have a configurable way of doing this. So you can you know, change the configuration and, you know, adapt it to a particular runtime. Uh, other things are those green, um, uh, uh, nodes are also figuring out what scale factors to use. And we have uh, advanced technique uh, for finding out which we call uh, signal to quantize noise ratio. So we try to find these scale, these optimal scale factors, uh, which may exclude certain outlier values and you know just try to have more resolution over the more uh, probable uh, uh, values uh, that we see in a particular activation or, or weight. So here is uh, some results out of this. And I, I, I can uh, obviously understand that with that one slide, I think uh, you're not going to perhaps understand everything that I said. But if you go back to um, uh, github.com slash quick slash amet, you will see uh, user guides which explain these techniques a little more in detail. And also, we have those videos on YouTube. So please look at those. So here are some results. Uh, we applied these uh, data-free quantization techniques, uh, and this is like you see different models. But let's look at like the MobileNet V2 model, uh, floating point accuracy. So what I want to take you to take away is like if you look at the integer eight inference versus the floating point thirty-two bit inference. There is uh, not a whole lot of difference between them, right? So they have come very close. Uh, you're running, you're getting all these benefits that we saw, but you're getting the accuracy that you would have gotten if you ran it in floating point. And you can actually apply this data-free quantization and the quantization of it training techniques uh, or combine them together. So you can apply this and then do quantization of it training on top of this. And that actually helps uh, quite a bit. So you would further close the gap. So specifically for MobileNet V2, I uh, just wanted to like uh, interesting data point is uh, you have you know, starting 71.72 floating point accuracy, if you, uh, depending on which model you use, if you take it to target, it's going to show you on integer 8-bit targets, it'll show you like close to 0% accuracy. It's, it's a very sharp drop, uh, depending on the model, of, obviously. Uh, but then you can see that even with those sharply dropped models, we have recovered it back almost close to where it was. So, uh, I mentioned that we've tried to make this uh, as user-friendly as possible. And so I think this is one slide which sort of tries to motivate that. So the data-free quantization techniques, like you saw, there are multiple techniques that go in there. And if you uh, peel the onion, there's actually uh, other things that happen, like uh, bias, uh, batch norm layers get folded, and so on and so forth. All of that gets wrapped up in this uh, in the first call, you see there equalize underscore model. So make one call, give it a model. In this case, this is our PyTorch model from Torch Vision. 
uh, give it that model, tell you know what is the input shape to your model, and that's it. In place, that model will be made better, and all those techniques get applied. Uh, the second half uh, shows how uh, you can uh, apply these quantization simulation nodes, and again, you you know give it a model. Uh, you make one call to compute encodings, which is going to find those scale factors, which we call as encodings as well. And once you've done that, you have this simulated model, sim.model, uh, which has these nodes inserted into it. Now you can invoke your existing pipeline like this evaluate model is the user pipeline to evaluate. Uh, and like if you did evaluate underscore model and passed it model, You'll get the floating point accuracy. If you did evaluate model and pass in sim dot model, you get the integer or a simulation of the integer eight bit accuracy, and uh, it's it's fairly simple. It plugs in with existing pipelines. So I think that's the main takeaway from this slide. Uh, so going on to uh, uh, compression. Uh, so there are a bunch of compression features. Um, one on the left is our tensor decomposition kind of feature. So what happens here is you take a layer, like a convolutional layer, and you split it into two layers. Uh, and you would say, oh, that's uh, not compressing. That's like inflating. Uh, but the the way you, uh, compre you split it into these two layers, uh, you have s two smaller layers. And the combination, even with the two layers combined, the combination it is much smaller than the layer you started out with. And uh, so the way this works is you see, like you may have a, a weight matrix on this layer, on this convolution layer you started out with. Uh, we flatten it into a two dimensional space. And then we uh, basically uh, apply the singular value decomposition technique from, you know, from your math classes. And you get like two different, uh, two, uh, uh, reduced um, uh, matrices. So generally with singular value decomposition, you have three matrices. The second, the third one in the middle is, is, a, is a diagonal matrix with uh, singular values or small numbers. Uh, and what we do is you can throw away some of those numbers. They are small, so you can throw them away. And so now you get uh, essentially two smaller layers if you combine that back into, uh, into two layers. So you take that diagonal matrix throw away some of the values and then combine it back, multiply it back with the one on the left and one on the right, you get two smaller layers. Uh, the technique on the right channel pruning that is going to take convolutional layers, let's say, and throw away some of the input channels to those convolutional layers, because maybe not all of the features are as important to the final accuracy of the model given your task. And it uh, basically throws that away, it changes the model architecture because you have to change the remaining architecture in place uh, so to, because you have changed you know the dimension of this uh, particular layer so it goes to the previous layers and changes its dimension and so on um, and one thing that i want you to take away is while there are these techniques and there is you know a bunch of like uh, nitty-gritty details and math involved in them uh, how these techniques are applied and how you select how much to compress each layer, all of that is done in a somewhat automatic fashion. And so uh, the, the automatic selection of these you know, per layer compressions is I think one of the uh, key takeaways from it. So it's easy to use and uh, you can go, you can you don't have to use the easy to use APIs, you can go in and use the more underlying APIs uh, if you wanted to try something different. So these techniques can be applied like back to back the spatial SVD and channel pruning techniques. And here is here are uh, some results like ResNet 50 and ResNet 18. These are some of the more popular models. And uh, you will see that um, we achieve quite a good reduction. There's a 50% MAC reduction. And the accuracy stays you know, very close to where we started out from. So very, uh, very interesting uh, and heartening results. And I have a, a demo for you uh, to show. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so it, it's it's a, a real time pose estimation model. And let me share my screen and show you. So it's easier for you to see. So uh, what you're going to see in this video is um, here is uh, just a computer monitor, and it's playing a video of you know some people dancing on the beach. 
or close to the beach. And we have two phones over here. Uh, these are actually commercial phones. Uh, so, you know, no funky business going on here. And the one on the, on the top is using an uncompressed model. The one on the bottom is using a compressed model. In this case, this pose estimation model is a fairly heavy model. Uh, so if you run it uncompressed, you get only like five frames per second. Uh, that's the inference. It's all gated by how much, inf uh, how fast you can run the inferences. Whereas in the compressed model, we compress that model down, you know, more than four times. And um, not only is, it, is you see on paper gains, but you can see like real gains on device where the inferences are sped up by, you know, close to a factor of four. Right, so I'm gonna play this video. The way uh, we've tried to show this is we do the inferences and then we superimpose the results on top of the video. Um, and so the video, it, it's just taking the video stream from the camera here, right? Uh, so you see that the, the skeletons lag the people and that's just a way of us showing that the inferences were so late. But as you see on the bottom, the compressed model, you can see those that those uh, uh, skeletons actually are very much tight on top of the actual uh, people in the video. So, um, yeah, hopefully that was interesting for you. Uh, we also have uh, built-in uh, visualizations, like tools to help you see, you know, how your model is, how is the compression going, how, you know, is it good for quantization, not good for quantization. So there are a built, uh, number of built-in visualizations. Um, so, yeah, uh, I wanted to, like, sort of end with some sort of insights on we, uh, as we, you know, did this open source project, you know, what were some of the learnings we had as part of this. and. Um, you know, one thing we sort of uh, realized is like we we would like you know as people make uh, comments and you know as contributors come in and uh, help make comments. Even since the time we launched, there have been like clo close to a hundred comments already made uh, just within the last month or so, um, and we want those comments to be uh, you know regressed. Uh, so we don't want we want to make sure that you know as the comments come in. Uh, they don't break existing stuff. So we had to set up, uh, we we are using Jenkins uh, CI um, and we you know, set it up on an AWS instance. We set up some dockers so that we can have a reproducible environment. And then we, uh, from GitHub, uh, from the PRs, we drive these jobs. Uh, so that has helped a lot. So that was one thing that we, uh, you know, had to think through and say, okay, this is something that we would need. Uh, same thing, we had to make our unit tests be much more expanded. Um, we used to test like some through unit tests and some some full blown tests with these big models and so on. And it just doesn't help to have those big models be part of a PR regression. I think you want the PR regressions to be fairly tight, small, short. And so we wanted to express the same. So we expanded our unit test to cover a whole lot of uh, scenarios. So we don't need to run it with these full blown models. Um, and then one thing that we haven't, we still are working on is like we realized that you know, people have disparate development environments. So uh, while we, um, you know, uh, assume that, hey, yeah, most people would have workstations with CUDA enabled workstations, like with GPUs on them. Uh, and it's it's actually helps for these techniques to have uh, uh, CUDA because we do accelerate some of these techniques using CUDA. Uh, but you know, if for folks who or developers who don't have uh, that environment, you know, we should make it available such that they can still run a uh, little bit slower, but they they should still be able to run. And so I think that last item is something that we learned, but we are still working on. So yeah, in summary. Um, uh, we have, you know, very happy to launch this uh, AI model efficiency toolkit, um, and it has uh, these uh, state of art quantization and compression uh, techniques, and more are being uh, are in the works. And we hope to work along with the community and keep adding more. And we would really love to see contributors come in and help us uh, expand uh, uh, this toolkit. Um, and we currently support TensorFlow and PyTorch models, and we 
perhaps add some more support for Keras going forward and you know with more contributions we could do more um and yeah the main thing is we are trying to design a user friendly uh, way of op optimizations uh, so please come visit us collaborate with us at uh, github.com quick aim at uh, and here's a link to if you go to youtube and you search for polcom innovation center uh, or quick space aim at uh, you will see a whole set of videos, like about six or so, and they they would go into much more detail, including code examples and so on, uh, uh, in, into these features. So um, that's it. Th thanks for the uh, for you know paying attention and let me uh, explain these things to you. So I see that there are some questions um, that have come in. So um, one question is, um, if we quantize the parameters, uh, we won't have the best model accuracy. Um, meaning, I, I guess the question here is uh, perhaps that, hey, if you quantize, you know, what happens to your accuracy? And as, as we saw through the, uh, through the deck, I think it all depends. There are some models uh, Resonate 18 is a good example. I think it, you know, just by doing basic quantization uh, techniques, um, you can actually run it on 8-bit integers and not see a huge drop, like less than a percent of accuracy drop. Uh, but other models, like the MobileNet V2 example we saw, there, there is a sharp drop in accuracy. So it all depends on your on the model. Uh, but yeah, we believe these techniques help with some models that they are not magic bullets to help with all models. But we continue to find uh, like research other techniques like the add around and nation beds and more stuff is uh, are coming. And uh, we we think that for the for the vast majority of the models out there, we we should be able to run them on eight bit integer. Uh, and you know there are certain models where if that is super uh, hard to do some layers not all layers some layers could be run at 16-bit integer and i think with 16-bit integer our experience has been that practically all models can you know run with almost no drop in accuracy so uh yeah so i think yeah quantizing does have a uh, impact but i think the techniques and that's the reason for tools like amet to help recover back the accuracy I think another question was um, uh, how to use REST APIs. I assume you know can the can this be invoked using REST APIs? And I think while there is nothing built in here for this tool for uh, REST APIs, but uh, you can like host this uh, uh, tool anywhere and you know build some REST APIs on top. Should be fairly simple to do, I would think. Uh, so yeah, does, no, nothing precludes, not that it has today, but any REST API support, but nothing precludes that to be added. Uh, another question was, uh, does Qualcomm have any specific chip or edge device to work on AI or deep learning? Uh, so yeah, if you if you look at, you know, uh, a lot of the cell phones, I mean, which is the most, uh, you know, sim simple device that you may have access to, uh, is a lot of the cell phones have uh, Snapdragon chipsets in them. Snap, Snapdragon chipsets have uh, AI inference, inference engines, uh, specific, uh, which also run with integer uh, quantized models and uh, get all those benefits that we looked at up front. So yes, definitely Qualcomm is uh, in the edge AI uh, business, if you may. And so they have uh, different, we have different solutions for this. Uh, can you place the link to GitHub? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't need to. I think place it. I guess you can go to GitHub.com slash quick q i c slash aim at a i m e t, and uh, that's it. Uh, another question: Will this work without NVIDIA GPU cards? Let's say Open CL. Uh, it says in the installation procedure that this is a requirement. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Alexander. Yeah, like I mentioned in the 
one of the key learnings we have had is I think, you know, people's development environments are different. So at the very moment, yeah, there is some, the way it is built, uh, it assumes um, uh, CUDA. Uh, but we are, I think, working on uh, making a version which uh, would not have uh, CUDA requirements. And then if you wanted to use some other accelerators like OpenCL or whatnot, uh, you you can definitely uh, do that. Uh, you will have to make a few code changes, but uh, please come uh, work with us. There is a forum as well for Q&A uh, going from that same GitHub location. Uh, and we, we, uh, we would love to chat with you to see you know, if that's something that we can collaborate on. Uh, maybe one last question. Um, how do we select features which uh, do not create an impact? Or do we independently train the model for each feature? Uh, so I'm not sure exactly I follow the question, but um, yeah, so let me ask, answer it in a more generic fashion. So uh, let, let's say if you take ResNet 50 as an architecture, right? So that um, uh, has a very uh, robust architecture for, you know, uh, finding features in, 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 in from a vision uh, use case, right? So if you give it images, it's going to find these kind of in, uh, features in it. And uh, now you put some sort of head networks, generally that's what people do uh, on top of the ResNet. And then like you may be interested in specific uh, learning specific things like you may want to do face detection and that's that's your uh, task so uh yeah maybe i think what i meant was that for so you you are you know base model can do a lot more uh than what your what your immediate task is and so given uh, something like this use case that base model that resonant 50 model is over parameterized it's you know it, it, it can do a lot more than what you need and so this is a very good use case for applying these model compression techniques that we looked at and so that that's where you can get those gains uh, reduce the complexity of the model uh, in an automatic fashion without uh, having a hit on accuracy so uh it's right about the time that i think i uh, was allot allotted uh, so thanks a lot for attending this uh, lecture uh, uh, I had real fun. I think please continue uh, questions on the Slack channel uh, and I'll, I'll uh, stick around and answer uh, some of those questions. Um, and yeah, thanks for giving me this opportunity and thanks to the Linux Foundation as well.